I am delighted today uh, to introduce to you a, a very good lawyer who has done crucial work to make separation of powers work in the state of Rhode Island. Um, I first got to know uh, Mike Egan when he was counsel to the House Separation of Powers Committee in the spring of 2003. Isn't that far back? Yeah, because, because you were there. You were there when we were uh, passing the amendment. I was. It actually started with iron. So yes, I was there because I started working with Mike Lenahan on it. Yeah. So you were involved from the beginning. It's it's funny. You at the state house, you go by people and don't always get to know them, uh, and um, but then you work on a committee or on a project, and then you get to know people. But even so, I was dealing, tended to deal more with the committee chair, Elaine Kadir, and with Paul Crowley, the vice chair. And uh, so even this morning, as Clint and Mike have been talking back and forth, we've made some, some connections that we didn't know we had. So uh, Michael Egan is a fine attorney who was responsible for writing many of the bills that implemented the Separation of Powers Amendment. He was also involved in the final passage of the amendment. And we want to get to that, but first, I, 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 as I've done with some other people, Mike, I'd like to suggest that maybe you would say a couple words um, about the influences that shaped your conscience and character and uh, prompted you to study law. Hmm. I can do that. It's very. I took a very interesting path to law school. In that I'm from Edgewood originally, and one of nine kids, about a second, youngest boy out of six boys and three girls. And my father had a business in the early '60s. He had nine kids. He was working for companies out of New York, the candle companies. And he found out that they were holding back on his commissions and everything else. It was a very big deal at the time. Obviously, he's got nine kids and, and no. Uh, and he left the company and had no job. So he started his own candle company in a house in Edgewood, which violated every zoning ordinance you can possibly imagine. <laughs> uh, well, with that, you know, I went to high school, went to St. Paul's and Hendricken, and never thought I would ever go to law school. Because through that company, I then became associated with a trucking company in Pawtucket, and I was 18 years old making Teamster money. At that time, that was a significant amount of money for an 18-year-old kid. So there was no real incentive for me in college. I did okay. I was in the business program. So it was never really found what I wanted to do. And I was making a lot of money for an 18-year-old kid. I mean, I had paychecks of six, seven, eight hundred dollars a week. And this is in the 70s, 76, 77. Now, I didn't save it like I should have. Didn't invest <laughs> it like I should have. My father was telling me everything, but at that point. I was in that position of I didn't need to listen to them. Not that we were antagonistic, but I paid my own way through college. Paid, you know, I kept myself in college, though. I went to work full-time, always took a class, always stayed involved. And I noticed a very good friend of mine I was in school with, you know Tony DeSisto. Sure. We were fraternity brothers. Let me just mention Tony DeSisto was the chair of the Ethics Committee at the Constitutional Convention in 1986 right. that proposed the ethics amendment that we've talked about and we'll talk about more. But, so that's a very important connection I didn't know you had. Yeah, we became good friends. And he said to me one day, as I was still loading trucks, still staying in school, but not really sure, he graduated from URI, and we started together. Now here he is graduating, he's a close friend of mine. And he said to me one day, he said, Mike, you've always been very, very intelligent. I was always well-read, I always read, I'm kind of a history buff, would read books, whatever I could. And he said, your language and your communication skills are deteriorating. He said that to me one day, just over pizza. Because loading trucks, the language is not that great. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't even begin to you, Donald Trump is mild. <laughs> we heard every day. And it kind of stuck in my head. And my dad always kept telling me, when are you going to use your brain instead of your back? And one day I got hurt at the drug company. Here I was, got hurt bad. You know, disc injuries, it's a typical that type of job. Out, they want to do surgery. I'm only 28 years old or something. At 26, rather, and I said, you know, that's time. That's a sign. I went back to college, Rhode Island College, but I switched to communications as a major, which was speech, and then uh, got a little bit of a minor in a business program. But that I, it just hit with me. 
It became a very easy course for me. I enjoyed it, got on the debate team. And from there, Tony had gone to law school and graduated. And he said, why don't you take a law school? And I took a couple of law classes at Rhode Island College. And we had a law professor who was a former law professor for a, a law school who taught it in the same fashion. And I did very well. And that's when I decided to go to law school. So I ended up in a small school up in New Hampshire, Franklin Pierce, who at the time, only in Rhode Island, who comes up behind me, my year behind me, is Bill Murphy. Bill Murphy <laughs> later went to become Speaker of the House. So, and we bartended together in law school. So that's like the big only in Rhode Island story. So I came back, went to work, worked in the Attorney General's office for about seven and a half years, and then started my own practice. And casually got involved with politics. I was talking about Clint, I don't know how far you want me to get involved with that. But I got a call one day, I was not involved with politics, not involved with the state house, but you know everybody. I knew all the speakers, I knew the lawyers, because the lawyers practicing in the state, every lawyer who did criminal cases came before me at some point in those seven years. So you can't help but to know everybody. And then um, the lawyer for the Senate Corporations Committee had, I think his partner got very sick and had to step down. I don't want to mention names. And I got the call out of the blue. I, had not even put, I don't have an application in anywhere. Some of the Senator Irons had said, I need somebody. John O'Connor was the head of legal counsel down the ledge council. and said, I got a kid who's pretty sharp, just got out of the AG's office. Okay, send him up. So there was no, can you get my son a job? There was none of this stuff. It actually wasn't worth it because it didn't pay much money <laughs> at the time. And so that's how I ended up in the state house. It's only a part-time position for me. And from there, the separation of powers started to ratchet up. And ratchet up. And I remember Bill Lyons called me into his office one day. He was now Senate president. And this is before everything else happened. And he said to me, go find out what this is all about. Why can't we just take the legislators off the boards? Why do we need an amendment? And then I said, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about, separation of powers? What, what, what is all this? And at that point, Mike Lenahan was appointed. And he, I get to meet Mike, who was a very smart man. And we had a long discussion, and I began to realize what this was. This was not an easy thing to venture. And I went back to Heinz and said, this is not an easy thing that's going to happen here. I mean, this is a real shift of power within this building. And looking just philosophically or from a theoretic point, this is going to gut things. This is going to change things. And then at that point, there was a change in the Senate presidency for a lot of reasons. And um, Montebano took over in the Senate. He had his legal counsel was uh, Billy Carnes, a nice, very nice man. We met a lot of times on it. But at that point, Bill Murphy had taken over at this, on the House side. Well, Bill and I remained friends, but I wasn't involved with him. And he picked up the phone and called Montebano. He was starting in on separation of powers with Elaine Coderre. He called Montebano and said, can you send Egan over here? Personally, probably because he just wanted somebody near him. That You need to trust people. You need to have people you can chat with, talk about sports, just be a regular person with. And then he said to me, when I got over there, uh, to Representative Codier, is a very nice woman, very hardworking woman, but she was getting bombarded, when I say inundated, with information. Because all of a sudden, every agency, about 120 at the time, maybe 150, well, 120, most of them didn't meet. <laughs> and, well, but there's also the confusion, because <laughs> our goal was to remove legislators from boards and commissions that had administrator or executive powers. We didn't care about study commissions right. or advisory commissions, but it was those where they had executive powers. That was the concern. Um, and of course, at that point, by our raising the question, and which we had been doing since 1995, so this, the issue is already seven years old, and as you heard from Bob Flanders last week, the Supreme Court had already ruled that um, the Ethics Commission did not have the authority to require legislators to step off those boards. And then they ducked the questions of whether separation of powers had to be the law of the land in the state of Rhode Island. So we were in kind of a quandary at that point. And over several years, Mike Linehan uh, on the Senate side and several people, including David Cicilline on the House side, had put in draft amendments. And then uh, once the Supreme Court in 1999 declared that Rhode Island was a quintessential system of parliamentary supremacy, that's their phrase, 
and that uh, there was no need to do anything differently. Uh, we were really in a quandary how to go forward. And so Mike Lenahan on the Senate side was ready to push that issue, although he knew that a lot of people would be upset, and so were the leaders on the House side, because as Mike has already said, it was a huge shift in power within the State House. So you're now counsel to the House Separation of Powers Committee. Governor Almond in 2000 posed a question asking, uh, should there be a constitutional convention to address the question of separation of powers? And the people, 66% voted yes. In 2002, uh, the uh, Governor Almond po posed a second question, which, as I mentioned in the book, several of us helped to write, which said, should uh, the Constitution be amended to remove this authority that went back to King Charles II. Uh, and uh, several people said that was a loaded question. And we said, yes, it was a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> but we, that question was on the ballot. And we had 72% or something like that, 76%, I think, approved it. And so uh, the, we were moving toward a confrontation. In the spring of, 19, or of 2002, the Senate passed uh, an amendment, not the same one as we finally brought forward, but the Senate passed it. It was Mike Linehan's bill, and also one by Dennis Algier, the Senate minority leader. And so that bill had passed the Senate. So here now the House is increasingly isolated because the governor and the Senate have now made a commitment to move and do something substantial on separation of powers. And the House resists that. And so at that point, Mike now is the, the counsel to the committee, which is going to consider that bill. And I've got the bill up on the screen behind us. I don't know if you can read it from where you are. You've, you've had it since the beginning. Uh, but Mike, I wonder if you have any comments about what's in that. He's, he's printed it out here. And, uh, well, there's a couple of ways. Phil comes at it from a very historical perspective, legislative, uh, theoretical perspective. I come at it from a different perspective, which is getting hit with it. And <laughs> when, I walked, oh, sorry. when I walked into the Separation of Powers Committee the first time, Elaine Coday was there, and I met a lot of people, but there had to be 10 people, each one with their own agenda, each one from different agencies, well-meaning, I have no criticism of it because people were getting involved, but they were just piling on. And, and literally, she, they were like at her the first time I was in there. And there are different attorneys involved who weren't with the state house, but with their agencies that had some influence out there. They would shoot the paperwork was this thick. I, it would fill this room, the amount of paperwork that I walked into. I was like, what is this? And that's when Bill Murphy, who had a lot of other things on his plate, his speaker, just taken over, transition to power as a speaker is a very difficult process, trying to coordinate his people, see what his agenda is going to be for the year. And he said, please get control of that committee. And then I realized, once I got into it, I didn't realize the full impact of this until it was actually, this was actually written right in front of me. And I was I'm looking at the legislators were continually coming up to Elaine and I saying, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? I said, you have to get off these boards and commissions right now. Because this legislation didn't give them two years from now, when your term expires, anything. Well, this, had, this hadn't passed at that point. Though. Right. But so it was coming. It was coming. There was this, no doubt it was coming. This is the text that a bunch of us, after John Harwood fell, after the election of 2002, uh, he was still in the legislature, but he lost the speakership, as Mike has said, and, and uh, Murphy, Bill Murphy became speaker with a pledge that they would go forward and they would deal with separation of powers. Pledging to do it is quite different from accomplishing it. And that was the task that lay ahead. This amendment had been drafted. We had a meeting at the Attorney General's office. Sheldon Whitehouse was leaving as Attorney General. And uh, so it was... He was a big supporter. He was, he, he was the one who launched this. Right. Got, got to give Sheldon credit. He was the one who said to me, they've heard this, I'll say it quickly to you, in, way back in 1992, he said, the work you're doing on ethics and campaign reform is good but you will not cut the deep root of Rhode Island's corruption 
until you get to separation of powers. And I'm from New York, and I didn't know what he meant. I assumed every state had separation of powers. And so as Common Cause began to study it, then we recognized that Rhode Island was the one state where legislators served on every kind of imaginable kind of executive agency, and that that created multiple conflicts of interest. And most people didn't exploit those, but some did. And it, be, and it was problematic, and it, I, Sheldon, I think, to this day, was right uh, that it was the deep root of Rhode Island's corruption. And it wasn't that everybody who sat on the boards was bad. That was not true at all. And people on the boards believed that they were providing oversight to the legislature itself. By They would come back to the leadership and say, this is what's going on on the Coastal Council. This is what's going on on the lottery. Um, but it also created problems because the legislators, in some cases, used their position in ways that were hurtful to agencies or for patronage and so on. Didn't mean to get off on that. No, that's that. okay. But, but so how, what can you share with us of what was going on inside the committee and, and that process as the hearings began? I would say a lot of it was education, which is all of us needed to be educated to the real nuances of what was happening. This final draft, I believe, was your draft, yes. White House's. Uh, we That's didn't do we did. much. We didn't do much to the draft. I don't think no. on the House side. Very little, maybe a comma appeared, but we didn't do much change to this final draft. One word change only. Yeah. We had had separate and co-equal, right. and it became separate and distinct. Yeah. So this was Branches. the final version was the one that was in front of us. And a lot of it was the legislators, again, remembering they're only part-time. Many of them are business owners or, you know, have other things going on, was sitting in the committees and didn't, we'd be educating them as we were getting educated on what this thing is going to do as it passes, before it passes, or after it passes. And it was just this ongoing, continual education, and it was also this ongoing, continual, I became, for lack of a better word, a blocker, which was to create a wall between all the entities that had an interest in this, and individuals, and Elaine Codier. She's a very, very nice woman. Out of Pawtucket, um, lives in the tenement house with her family in Pawtucket since she started, and she still lives there. I mean, she worked for elderly homes, elderly care facilities. That is her life. Her life was a legislator, and her family never took ten cents from anybody. Nope. Uh, and it was to block her so she could get some breathing room and figure out what we're going to do next and how we're going to implement this. And then I forget the time frame of the passage. Well, what happened in the spring of two thousand and three? You passed this at the end of the session. Right. And then beginning in 2004, suddenly, uh, 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 although you didn't, ha actually we didn't go ahead and pass any of that until the 2005 session because the amendment hadn't passed yet. But 2005, 2006 session, suddenly they're stacked up with bills and with committees that have to change. And the complexity of that process was huge. Mike mentioned that People came in from boards and agencies, and citizens came in. And uh, I mean, I, I had a minor uh, experience of what Mike's describing because people would call Common Cause, and they would say, "I'm I'm on the uh, on RIPTA, uh, or I'd like to be on RIPTA. How do I get on to be on to be on the Rhode Island Public Transit Authority board? How do I get on the Rivers Council? Uh, who's going to be on this?" And I didn't have any, any clue what, was, uh, what those answers would be. Our principle was that you had to move the legislators off. And then the challenge was how to rebuild those boards. But the difficulty was that these boards had been created over many, many decades. And a couple of them were very similar in their basic architecture. But many of them were entirely different in terms of the appointment scheme, uh, and so on. So maybe you pick up with that. I mean, that was a huge problem. It was a big problem because mathematically, all these senators and, and legislators mm -hmm. had to get off the board immediately. All those boards and commissions had certain numbers of people on them. You take those people off, now you don't have quorums. Now you have leadership problems. Who's in charge of these commissions? Who does what? They can't vote. There's, there's bonding issues. There's things that have. Some of these commissions have to function and they need to keep going. So there were issues immediate, that was one of the immediate concerns. The other concern was, how do we implement, implement this in a way that, while the legislator can't have influence, all these commissions are legislative creatures. They're all created by the legislator. Governor doesn't create anything. 
Coastal resources created by the legislator. So how to operate these and how to, and the, the real battle, this tug of war was, how to still be involved and stay with influence within these agencies that we created. But the battle from the other side is, but you can't have the influence. So you can't be on it. So there were some different languages proposed as to how do we replace them under advice and consent of the Senate, who's going to advise and consent, what influence will they have on the appointment process became the big focus. And that's where we must, I don't know how long we battled until we came up with the final languages he, Phil talks about in the paperwork of due consideration, meaning you can have some recommendations, but you can't specify. But we were surprised. I was shocked. I remember sitting at the hearing uh, in room 313, which you'll see when we go to the State House at the end of the session, or at the end of this course. But I was sitting there, and, and uh, th they have been presented with a letter from Governor Kachiri at this point that says uh, they cannot have any description <coughs> of qualifications for people who will serve on boards. And I was flabbergasted. Because as long as I have been here, and, and from what I know from other states, it's fairly common that the legislature creates some conditions. They want certain qualifications, and that's a reasonable thing. <coughs> but Kachiri was saying, none at all. Well, you know, it's f completely free for the governor to appoint whomever he wants. And we were uncomfortable with that, and it looked like that was going to be a real Donnybrook, and I, I don't remember what the day of that was. But at that point, Jim Davey, who was a Republican from Cranston, who fortunately had a lot of experience in the federal judicial system in Washington, and so he knew how a lot of things went there under separation of powers. And Jim Davey turned around and said, Madam Chair, uh, I think there's federal language that says uh, that the president must give due consideration to nominations from uh, various sources, recommendations. recommendations. And uh, uh, that, that seemed to be a, a breakthrough. Maybe you'd talk about what that felt like. That was, it was an issue, and, and I think you, to explain it in lay terms, because sometimes we talk like lawyers. Sorry. Are, that's okay. <laughs> You've got to understand what this was. If there was an agency that had specific uh, duties, and they may involve engineering issues, Turnpike and Bridge Authority, or Coastal Resource Management. There may be certain qualifications that need, are needed to run this entity. And if we specified we wanted the head of the state, I don't know, some engineering commission or something, or board of engineers to be on it, they would say no. But we could say the board of engineers could make a recommendation. What we couldn't say is the head of the board of engineers had to be on it. Didn't matter. It wasn't about politics, it was about we couldn't specify. And that was the real battle. How do we get the people we need on the boards and commissions to run them? Some of these are big bonding boards and commissions that involve hundreds of millions of dollars of bondings going on with school committees and everything else coming through the state house. So you need people with finance backgrounds, but we couldn't say the head of Fleet Bank. And that became the battleground. How specific could we be in our request of who we wanted on? versus the governor's executive function saying, no, this is our baby now. you passed separation of powers. You can't tell us who to put on these boards and commissions because that's too much control. So ultimately it became this term, we'll listen to you, we'll consider it. We don't have to accept it, but we'll consider it when we make our decision. So it allowed them to narrow the criteria, but you can't make the criteria so specific it only relates to one person. You know, you can make the criteria that somebody from Jamestown who has this, who has that, and maybe only the head of the town council in Jamestown has those criteria, therefore he ends up on the board. So, and then a lot of, there was a lot of play going back and forth on how specific we can make this to make sure our guy got on the board. And that's where it kind of left off. So I think the due consideration has generally worked. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting part politically for me was just the volume of material that poured into the part-time legislature. At the time, this is pre-computers, as far as paperwork. The, the room was just full of boards and commissions, redraft, redraft, redraft. Commissions we never heard of, 
had not met in 20 years. <laughs> Jamestown, the, Jamestown Ferry Commission. Yes. The Narragansett Indian Commission. Yep. My favorite. You, you gave me the list the other day. I actually left it at home. Well, you, it's there page. somewhere. And I looked through this list, and well, we deleted commissions. Let's say there were 120. Huge numbers of them had never met. They were well-meaning at the time, but nobody ever followed up with them. Like small issues. Narragansett Indian something or other commission. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. It had not met in 20 years. <laughs> so we just deleted a lot of these out. We put it, we post them. If you have any interest in this commission, come, you know, show up. Nobody knows anything about it. It doesn't do anything. It hadn't met. It's not costing the state anything. Let's just delete it. We did. We got rid of, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 of these commissions. You had to see them come out of the woodwork when I said the name. <laughs> Unbeknownst to us, there was a bond issue with that going way back, and I think it had something to do with their, their housing or something happened, and, and it was just like, who, well, like, who are you? <laughs> where, where, where did you, you come been? from? We don't know anything about you. But that happened a lot. Mike, would you mention some of the tension over some of the more powerful commissions? I mean, sure. you, 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 you did one bill, and I'll give it, I sent that out to you about the Lottery Commission. So there were several approaches. One was simply to take the legislators off and let the commissions continue. And another approach that Common Cause didn't suggest, we were a little afraid that we would seem too aggressive if we did, but they decided to do it. So they took the Lottery Commission and folded it into the Department of Administration. Eventually, they took the Coastal Resources Management Council and folded it into the Department of Environmental Management. So they became part of an executive agency. But maybe that was really, a, must have been a tough those, one from the inside. I would say, politically, those were the two toughest ones that pop into my head. Well, clean water finance, too. But more importantly, it was coastal, because at the end of the day, coastal was created by the legislature. And in the legislature itself, it says in our Constitution that the legislature is responsible, legislator is responsible for our coastal waters. And our oceans. It's in the Constitution. There's one line somewhere. I forget which article. Article 1, Section 17. That's <laughs> um, make a long story short. So there was always this kind of hope that the legislator could stay in control of coastal. That even after separation of powers, it went to the Supreme Court twice to see whether or not we could stay involved with coastal with direct appointments. Because it was a creature of legislature. Is the article... Which one it is? Article 1, Section 17. 17. <laughs> that says the people shall, and that came out of the Constitutional Convention in 1986, and it said the people shall have access to the shoreline, and the General Assembly shall guarantee that. I don't know, by, by re, it says shall regulate them. Right. So the question is, what did regulate mean? So that mean legislate and create laws, or did it mean sit on and administer? And that it was, was part a of the real goal. battle. And that battle existed well after all the other boards and commissions were reconfigured. We did reconfigure them. We cut down the number of some boards, may have had 30 people, I don't know, 20. We cut those numbers down, tried to make it an odd number so there would no be quorum, not be quorum issues. Then the issue became who was going to appoint the head of these different commissions. Um, but COSA, we held on to, we being the legislator, we held on to for a couple more years until it went to the Supreme Court at least twice. Two, one. Well, when finally, they went for an advisory opinion. Yeah, and they kicked uh, it in, back. In, two, in 2007, though, and in, so the, here, the uh, oral arguments were down at Salve Virginia in, I want to say, the fall, probably October, late September of 2008, and the ruling came out in December of 2008 that said the legislature cannot have members uh, on the council or make appointments to the council. And first we sent up the actual language for code. We kept the statute exactly as it is written. It's about this thick. And we sent it for an advisory opinion. Supreme Court kicked it back and said, we're not going to give you an advisory opinion because this is existing law. It's not a new law that we're going to give advice on. They give advisory opinions on new legislation. So they said to me, redraft something. So I think I changed two words in a 20-page <laughs> statute and sent it back. And I got this, you know, kind of internally some information from the Supreme Court from Justice Goldberg to her husband. It was like, are you kidding me? That was the message I got back. But they did agree to hear it. So all we just, you know, it was kind of like, I'm like, you can't do better than this. So uh, but that's when they kicked it back and said, no, you're off, you're off. You can't be involved, you can't be involved. So the legislature had to get off. The other internal one was uh, 
the Lottery Commission. There's a lot of power in the Lottery Commission. Why? You look what's happening. Look how powerful the lottery is. Look how much money it's making. You got casinos involved. The Twin Rivers opening up. So, from a internal perspective, with the legislators, that's something they all want to be involved in. And I'm assuming I've got to assume there's reasons for that. I've got to assume there's jobs coming up there. There's you know stuff happening. Um, so, a lot of the legislators and people in the state house, and I will never mention names didn't want us to get off the Lottery Commission. They wanted us to separate that out and pass new language on them about the Lottery Commission and keep it. And then ultimately, internal battles back and forth, which damaged some of the issues with leadership. They lost people over it. And uh, some of their core people said, if you're not going to help us keep the Lottery Commission, we're no longer going to support you. But ultimately, he said, Bill Murphy, I think, was speaker at the time, said, no, it's got to go. We've got to get off. You remember, Rhode Island's Lottery Commission has nine mem had nine members, and three were sitting senators, three were sitting representatives, and three were public members appointed by the governor. No other board that controlled lotteries and gambling in other states had even one sitting legislator. So it was, it was a unique Rhode Island creation and no one quite knew how we would, this would get resolved. And it, it, it turned out to be a real struggle, but how did the decision get made to fold it back into the Department of Administration? Uh, some, I mean, some of those decisions I wasn't part of. I'm not in the back room, and I'm not saying that in the back room in a bad way, but I'm not up in the office while the speaker's talking to the head of his leadership team or arguing with other legislatures while this is going on. What do we do, what do we do? There's communication going on between the Speaker's office, the Governor's staff people, mm -hmm. uh, even though they don't talk sometimes, it doesn't appear, but there are, there's always lines of communication between the executive, the legislative, and even the judiciary, because there has to be. You have to function as a society. So there has to be, even when these two are like this, this is like even Hillary Clinton's campaign with Trump is a bad example. <clears throat> to arrange those debates, those two aren't talking to each other, but their staffs are talking. And you have to, because you've got to get to solutions. And I don't know who ultimately came up with that final solution, whether it was a committee effect or two or three people or somebody finally saying, why don't we just, remember the language somebody saying, why don't we just put it in the Department of Administration? So almost to get rid of the headache. Mm -hmm. I want to say in some ways it was a way to get rid of the headache internally to mm -hmm. stop the disputes amongst the legislators in the Speaker's office and whoever. I don't know what was said or not said, but that was one of the easier solutions. I think some of the other states did that. Some mm -hmm. of the other states have that, and that was an That's easy right. out. It took, the, it took the issue off the table. Let's, let's take a couple of questions from you. I don't want to, for us to go on too long, but you've been reading about this. Go ahead. I just have what I think is... Good and loud. Um, it says separate and distinct. Why doesn't it say equal? Because in the federal government, there are three equal branches. Why are there not three equal branches? Do you want to take that or you want me to do that? I really don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, 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 let me answer it quickly. Um, when we drafted this amendment um, at the Attorney General's office in December of 1998, uh, sorry, December of 2002, um, we struggled and, and numerous U.S. Supreme Court decisions speak of the branches as being separate and co-equal. And uh, so that's what we put in thinking that would be the thing, way to go. But it turned out that about, I, I would say, 40, 44 other states use separate and distinct. Uh, so it's, it, that language has been litigated over, you're a lawyer and you know what that's about, uh, has been litigated enough times that there would be less question. And one of the struggles that we had here was that at one point the legislature wanted to say full legislative authority would remain with the legislature. And that, if you've read that chapter, I write about the, the problem of the, the four-letter word at the end, and it was full, not uh, anything else. Uh, but that was the real struggle, to get language that would not be unique to Rhode Island because that would invite litigation. Uh, and endless court challenges. So that's why. So at that point, the House leadership said, "Look, we want to put on 
a series of whereas clauses. This is Mike Linehan bringing it out of the Senate. We want to bring in a bunch of whereas clauses, and we want to go to separate and distinct. So the whereas clauses were not going to be in the Constitution, and separate and distinct would. And curiously, we favored separate and distinct all along, so it didn't matter at all to us. So we said, fine, let's go with separate and distinct. And there's an underpinning, too, floating around, I think, in the back of everybody's mind. It may not have been real, but it still exists, which was the legislature was giving up, the House and Senate were giving up power, particularly the House, at this point, because they're not getting advice and consent. The Senate is getting all the advice and consent, not the House. So the House is like, well, what do we get? Now you're then putting the word co-equal in, in a branch of government that in this state historically, the legislature is more powerful at some perception, right or wrong, there's a perception and sometimes a reality that the legislature is a little bit more powerful than the executive. Not so much the judiciary, that really wasn't the issue. But the, the legislature kind of said, wait a minute, we're technically not co-equal. We are a little bit more powerful than the governor. We have a legislative government. And so that was part of this. They wanted to take out this co-equal thing. It was just kind of a fear, real or imagined, I think, that they'd already taken a punch. They're already losing power. Nobody likes to give up power. And they were voting on reducing their own power. That's a difficult place to be in. So I kind of think it worked almost to, not to say throw a bone, but the language worked. It took a lot of that away. It was enough palpable so they, they could move forward. Let's take other questions. So, if why do you think Murphy, I mean, if Howard hadn't been toppled for other reasons, uh, and now then Murphy came along, I know Murphy made a pledge when he be, was yeah. becoming speaker that he was going to move forward on separation of powers, but uh, they all knew what they were giving up, and, you know, they, they, I'm sure they, they didn't want to give it up. What, what, um, why did it seem like Murphy went along with this uh, after some difficulty uh, that he, he allowed this to happen why, why was that? Was he just feeling the pressure of, of uh, too much pressure? Or I, I don't want to speak for him yeah. because we're friends but again I wasn't in policy decisions I implemented them after they, they said where we want to go or I made suggestions back and forth uh, I, I think it was the type of person he is he made that commitment, he made it publicly mm -hmm. Uh, he had to stick by it. There were a lot of people in the legislature that were in favor of it. And some of the legislators were in favor of it, quite a few. So it wasn't as uh, us against them mentality, all 75 of us against them. It wasn't. There's big groups of people that were very much in favor of this. And some of the new members, more progressive members. Um, and then there was some of the old guard that didn't want it. So, but I think in his mind, he said, you know, I'm new. I've made this commitment. i got to do it. And he pushed on it, and he took some hits for it. He really did take some big political hits internally. Mm -hmm. He lost a lot of other things that he wanted over time because he couldn't get votes on various things. I, I don't want to go through them now, but time goes by and your memory fades. But uh, it was a big contentious issue, along with everything else that was going on. But I think in his mind, uh, it would be similar to, well, else? there's been some recent ones, making those commitments. I can't think of well, Matty Ellis' commitment Matty to the Ellis ethics, commitment to the ethics um, was definitely one of them. Uh, you got at some point that's you've made that commitment. It's a big deal. I don't think you can walk away from it. I think when I when I first got elected in '84, I mean I didn't even know about it. I mean it just was a standard procedure when a commission was being created. Just three from the House, three from the Senate, and, and uh, but there I, I think it was a smaller group of powerful people that knew really what it meant and knew where the benefits would accrue. And then, as things went on, you know, then you had people like Vinnie Mazzalella, who was really a beneficiary of some of this stuff, that, that power. Mm. Mike, maybe, go ahead. Does that, does that say that <coughs> had Murphy not come to power because of the, uh, I guess, Howard's power, that it never would have come to the fore? Would Howard have allowed this to happen? I, I don't think anybody can answer that question. No, I, I really I, I wouldn't I hesitate to speak for somebody else. It was fortuitous that it happened and Murphy yeah. made it. I, I, some people think that it only passed because of the Wendy Collins scandal that broke in the summer of 2002 and had legislators running from the speaker and calling for his, him to step down as speaker. Um, that's an easy way to describe it, but I think, in fact, uh, 
the numbers of members of the House, as Mike just mentioned, numbers of members of the House recognizing separation of powers was necessary, uh, were increasing. At the same time, the Senate had made a clear commitment and the governor had made a clear commitment. And all the candidates for governor in 2002 ran on a platform of winning separation of powers. So I think that the, that the struggle was nearing resolution and the fall of John Harwood hastened that resolution but I think it would have come in another year or two anyway. I think it would have come because the topic was so big now, local elections, people were asking their local person, oh, hey, are you in favor of separation of powers? Now, like they might not have for 10 years, now it's starting to come to the forefront of what this is. And maybe there was a scandal or two somewhere or some minor scandals with these commissions or some of the allegations of favoritism by somebody who's friends with a legislator on a board who got a contract for something. You know, so now I think the people, the voting public, were starting to pay attention to it. We're going to say, are you in favor of this or not? Or they weren't going to vote for you. So if it didn't happen under this regime, so to speak, the next group coming in was going to add more people to the House side or the Senate side that were in favor of it. So I think it was, like you said, it was coming. Let, let me re, re, put one last question to you, and, and there's, still, there's still time for other questions from the Sure, from I, the got, group, I got but, time. I don't, I'm uh, fine. But... Um, after these laws were passed in 2005, 2006, and then a few more in 2008, the House and the Senate, the Senate had already moved in that direction, began to look very consciously to say, now we are no longer putting members on these boards and commissions to report back to the Speaker of the Senate President what's going on. How do we provide oversight? And part of the vision that the reform community had from the beginning was that oversight would become more like congressional oversight, which sometimes can be superficial and uh, <clears throat> scoring political points, but often it can be valuable because agency heads know they're going to get called on the carpet and they have to have credible answers. They're under oath, so they can't uh, just make it up as they go along. Um, and so the Rhode Island legislature has begun some steps to move toward really providing oversight much more in the congressional model. The House Separation of Powers Committee became the House Government Oversight Committee. The Senate created a Government Oversight Committee. And now the House Committee, I think, is just called Oversight. Is that right? Oversight, House Oversight Committee. <clears throat> so now I, I want to go to your current role. Mike is now the House Parliamentarian. So he stands at the Speaker's elbow uh, during debate on the floor. <laughs> Why no. you want to I didn't volunteer for that either. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's now in the position where when there's a question of the rules in debate, why don't you describe, would you answer, let me put those two questions together, talk a little bit about what you do as parliamentarian, but this question of oversight and how you perceive it being implemented now that we're six or eight years into it. If there's one thing personally I feel, having sat through this process from beginning to end, that where there's a black hole and it's an oversight, because we, we did not plan... Everybody, well-meaning people, there's no criticism. But, again, we're dealing with a part-time legislator. They have a lot of things on their plate. We didn't plan for the actual impact. Now, at the time of this whole process, we interviewed people from every other state. Constitutional scholars from around the country came in to tell how they do it in this state, how they do it in that state. Wisconsin was the state we used a lot of influence from. <clears throat> but we haven't got oversight going. The value to having legislators on those boards and commissions is if you are having a problem, and you could be, you could have be, I'll use DEM as an example, I'm not picking on them. If you were trying to do something, you could be a small developer, a guy maybe trying to build another house, maybe you got a buffer zone issue. When you had a problem, your permit wasn't being acted on, you've paid an engineer, you've paid a lawyer, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, and again, you're not a big person with tons of money to fight. Nothing was happening. You could call the legislator, he lived down the street from you. He's your friend, he goes to church with you, goes to synagogue with you, goes to where, you know him. You could call him. He could call Representative Smith, who's on that board, and say, my friend's getting stiffed. How can you help him? Or can you check it up? That access is gone. 
That was one of the values to having the legislator on these boards and commissions. But, I mean, I certainly I think this is a better process. We, the oversight is lacking in the sense we weren't prepared after the fact. We put this implemented. It's coming. It's coming slow. Uh, ultimately, the oversight commissions will be as powerful or more powerful than finance. But it's not implemented. It's going to take full-time employees. You have to see the material for uh, Rhode Island uh, RIPTA. I mean, how that functions, where the bond money comes from, where do they buy their tires, where do they, why do they buy their tires from this company, not that company. That's all part of oversight. And it, become, it, it needs to be up and running, and it needs to go all year round. But we did this and didn't implement the second half of it. It's coming, but in the meantime, there's this gap where I think the general public isn't being served the way they need to be because they have nowhere to go. You're going to call the governor's office and say something's happening at DEM. Well, they get 10,000 calls a day. You know, even if they put an ombudsman or one or two people to try and solve these problems, you don't have that direct access into the agency. In, in congressional oversight, <coughs> A congressman or a senator can call the president's office or call the head of this EPA or the whatever the federal agency may be and often get action, uh, even though they're not on the board because uh, the agency knows that ultimately Congressman X, whoever it has to be, uh, can launch hearings or that there's a way to get hearings going. Uh, do you see any movement in that direction? I think it's starting. Um, again, I think it needs to be pushed a little more from all sources, including internally. I've tried to push it, but again, there's been another change in leadership at the House. That's trying to establish itself now. With this new election, will help go a long way to that, depending on what happens. <clears throat> Power changes deflect people from focusing on what was going on. Uh, so I think it's starting to be realized. I think this last term, believe it or not, I think this 38 Studios thing, debacle, has raised the issue of oversight higher, even internally, from people who weren't even there, legislators when 38 studios passed, not even have realized we need more. We've got to stop. We can't just rely on an executive <coughs> statement saying this is a good deal, pass it for us, which is what that was. There was no real vetting of it by the House and the legislature. It was all from the governor's office saying, here, this is a good, we, we do this for us. And then there are other things happening. Mm -hmm. but. I think it's raised the issue that this oversight has got to get up and running. Because otherwise you're not going to get any help if you need it. And, and I think there's a real fear attached. When I was doing oversight, when the first couple of years we started it, John D. Simone was the leader, of, was then chairman of oversight. And I'll never forget the first time, I'm just a lawyer working there, I called up a particular agency. I got, never got a phone call return so fast in my life. I mean, <laughs> the paperwork came, I asked for one single question, a document, we just wanted to follow up on something. We weren't under attacking them, we were just wanted to find out. The information came this thick, it was hand delivered the next day. <laughs> this is what we do, this is who we are, this is, and that, we were like, oh, I didn't know, it wasn't a bad thing. It was like, oh, I didn't know they did this too. Well, they did that, oh, that's a great idea, that's a great thing. And for Rhode Island Housing, uh, they came in, in that particular year, they were kind of mad at us, but it turned out they had had profit of, I want to say, five or six million dollars, which the legislator then had available to them to put into the budget. So without that call, without that oversight, that knowledge, they weren't doing anything wrong. They were doing what they were supposed to do. They had the money in the bank. They were doing, and then, but it made money available to the taxpayers. So that, you know, it needs to ratchet up. You may have seen in the, the section uh, 1999, the EDC scandal, where they were using credit cards. Uh, Economic Development Corporation was using credit cards and it became a scandal. And so the Senate created a, a committee to look at this, a special committee to examine it. And Mike Linehan was the chair, Teresa Piper Weed, now the Senate president, was the vice chair. And they conducted hearings. And the hearings were striking to me as I sat there and I wrote about this. Um, it, they were really striking because they began to ask, so what's your process for your audit? Do you have controls? Do you have a policy for use of credit cards? Who can use credit cards? Under what circumstances and what, with what kind of documentation? And Mike Linehan, uh, who is really one of the sa political saints of our state, I think, um, was very clear in saying, 
if you're sloppy in your administrative procedures, there's an opportunity for malfeasance or, or uh, wasteful spending or corruption. And the more precise we can make our administrative procedures and follow-up, the more effective it will be. And, and it was remarkable when they sent these questions to agencies, the agencies would come back and say, well, oh, we don't have a policy on that. We don't have a policy on that. And pretty quickly they got the message and they started coming in with binders full of policies and they moved quickly to become more professional. And of course that's what we all want from government. We're not looking to make unnecessary work for people, but it's valuable to say, you got to do these procedures because otherwise there's no way that anybody can check up and make sure that things are happening. And not only check up, but there's also access. And by that I mean if you know what the process and the procedures are, maybe you're going to put a bid in on something that may involve that, maybe buying new computer systems, maybe buying new equipment, trucks for DOT, whatever it is. If you know what their process is, now you know how to prepare for it. And maybe put in a bid for something. So as you use the term, or everybody uses the term transparency now. By having it out there, I think it allows more access to government. By having the policies and procedures, this is how we work, this is how we operate. You know, as a lawyer, you know, I, I do a lot of criminal work too, and I'm out at the Department of Corrections all the time. But I'm aware of how they function. And if they don't function within the realm of that, I use that to my advantage for my clients. Say, you're not following your own policy and procedures. That's not why did this one get transferred to medium, from maximum to medium to anti. Those can be big deals to my clients. But by knowing that in advance, and the Department of Corrections has, has this stuff out there, they have to, to function. It allows me the ability to work better. But on the other sector, go ahead, sir. Is there an open public meetings law that covers these various boards and agencies so that individuals could go to meetings and ask questions directly rather than having to go through their legislative representatives to get answers to things? Uh, I think there's a couple of questions within your question, but I think you... There, sir, what you did. They're supposed to do... Well, they're supposed to report every year or whatever in the time frame to... I got my glasses on. To the legislature on what they're doing, basically what they're doing. The, the committee, the House Separation of Powers Committee, created boilerplate um, language on reporting that became part of all the laws that passed. And uh, again, Mike was the one who was responsible for implementing or for putting that language in the right form for the particular agency. It's nine, there's a 90-day reporting requirement at the end of the fiscal year. That report, the reporting requirement, is, and it outlines a whole bunch of things they have to provide. But that's provided to the governor, the Senate president, and the Speaker of the House. So there's a way to access that through their information portals. However, uh, the better way, I think the faster way, is to go right to this agency directly if you want to look up what they're doing. And now that most of this is online, or it's supposed to be, and mm -hmm. I think this, it's better. It's a lot better than it was five or six years ago. There's still things missing. There's still data entry that's not being done in some of these agencies. Some of the, they're putting generic answers out there <coughs> instead of specifics. And that's where oversight comes involved, too. We, we need to pin them down and say, no, we need more. You just gave us a big number. You didn't tell us where that number, what you're doing with that number. You know, we used $200,000 for this. Okay, what did you do for this? Where did you buy that? Why did you get it this way? And that's where oversight needs to come in. But that's your best access. If you want to know when a board or commission is meeting, I would go directly to their websites now, or through the Department of Administration. The Rhode Island government website is not bad. Compared it's, to, I think it's, it's pretty good compared to other states. I've dealt with other states, I'm just trying to access some legal information for clients. And I think ours is generally pretty good. Uh, it can always use improvement. And you've got to get onto these commissions and boards to release the information. And if, you, if, if people want to serve, or are willing to serve, the governor has a process for welcoming uh, if you provide a resume to say, I'd like to serve on such and such a board. doesn't mean you're going to get the appointment, but that's a good process. Mark had a question. I was curious if you thought whether or not the, uh, the, the current fight over the, the legislative grants stuff, if that is a kind of a separation of powers issue. Hmm. Good question. I don't know if it's really a separation of powers issue. 
it's becoming an oversight issue. Where, where, why, and who? Where is this coming from? Why are they getting it? And who's getting it for you? And that's kind of the situation there. It's, I mean, it's a significant amount of money compared to the budget. It's not a lot of money. But you can use that analogy everywhere. Uh, but I, it is an issue. I don't want to say too much about it because I still work up there. <laughs> well, I continue to work up there. You want to continue? <laughs> yes, that's my health um, But on the other side, I think that issue is coming up. I think there's been gradually, I, I think there's been more uh, open process with that. And I think you're going to see that also becoming under either oversight through the media, through organizations like this, or the journal itself. Or it's going to be more under through an oversight process. There'll be a different process for handing these out, there'll be a committee process. I think one thing that has become readily apparent is, is we're very fortunate that you got that phone call that that attorney for whatever committee was got sick and they called you and had you come in because the work you did on... I almost uh, went bankrupt. <laughs> 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 I won't even tell you, but at the time I put it up there, and I will tell you my salary at the time was $25,000 a year, uh, and it was supposed to be part-time, and it was supposed to be when they're in session, it was supposed to be when the committees meet. I think I never was not there till seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, three to four days a week. And through more the often summer, it was ten o'clock at night. Yeah, through the summer, two or three, four years in a row. But I'm also kind of a history person, and I kept talking to people about it, and that's when Phil and I would have conversations. I got to know Phil. I didn't know anything about Phil. I knew of him, and he, sometimes the comments I heard were relatively negative. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, common cause of it. I mean, this, this <laughs> um, got to know him and talk about it, but I recognize that this was a historical event, and it really is in Rhode Island. It was a historical event. It was changing the Constitution, and it became very interesting to me. And so I, I went up there, I volunteered more, I, I stayed involved with it, and Elaine needed a lot of help to coordinate all this. So you, once you get into it, you were just in it. I had never even thought, never crossed my mind to do anything else. I mean, we're all the beneficiaries, and not only of work with people like you, but then going back historically as Common Cause and Phil, I mean, some of the long battles, whether it's ethics reform or a merit selection of judges, I mean, all, all those battles you identified, and then putting the coalitions together that you did was like herding cats, I'm sure. But, uh, well, and there were times, I didn't say this last week, and, and there's another question, but let me just say this quickly. Um, there were times, like after the Supreme Court decision that we reflected on uh, last week with Bob Flanders, when I lay awake um, and thought, we, we, we have no way to win this separation of powers fight. This is going to go on forever. Uh, and people are going to get bored and they're going to give up on common cause. And if I left common cause, I can't get a job anywhere else in Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew that was true because the, the speaker's reach was such that nobody would have dared. To if I had gone looking for a job elsewhere. So anyway, another question. I was just curious. You're not a legislator. But no, you're, I'm just. But you're not. employed by the legislature. Yes, I am. My current position is what they call House Parliamentarian, and it just kind of morphed through the process that the speaker asked me to come up there and stand next to him and take charge of something because something had happened, and he wasn't comfortable with. It. And he basically what I do now along with other things, and I, I advise this organization, oversight a lot, I talk to the lawyers a lot who still do it, um, is I keep track of the rules of the House, meaning who votes, when they vote, are they voting properly, is the bill before the House properly, did it come out of committee properly, did it get vetted properly, were the um, rules followed as far as posting the committee, did the public get notice of it, so I keep track of all that for the Speaker. And I, gotta, I have to be there when he's in session. I have to sit next to him and keep track of all this. I keep track of the time on how long these guys talk, which I've got a little bell there that buzzes. Yeah. I'm like, okay, they're, they're way over, Speaker. You know, can, we, can we shut this down? They're up to about eight minutes. Uh, but that's what I do now. In addition to, I'm used kind of as a resource because I've been up there for a while. So some of the newer lawyers might say, what's this, what's that? Well, I, I can say, well, this is why this is this, this is why that's that. So this is what you're looking for. Maybe we have time for one more question or comment. Anybody else? Does the does a change in the leadership of the assembly imperil your position? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's an at will position, and I'm used to that. And the attorney general's office is the same thing. I was there, so 
I try not, I mean, obviously, I know, the lack of a better word, my bread is butter, but I've also been very upfront with everybody. I've talked to the speaker, and all the speakers, all three that I've worked with, have all agreed with my position that I work for everybody on that floor as parliamentarian. And so I respond, if you have a question for me, you could be a Republican or somebody on the outside saying, when I do this, can I, how do I get this bill introduced? I will tell them. At the end of the day, I work for the speaker. But as far as my, the process of what I do, it's really apolitical. It's more organization. You're doing this wrong. No, you've got to go back, redraft this, and then get it introduced. Or you've got to go this way or that. Particularly with the new legislatures. They get legislators. They don't know what, which way to go. So. But I, yes, it's in peril. It's always in peril. Part of my wanting to have Mike come and speak to you was not just that he had this historical perspective from having done this work, but also because my sense has always been that he was a straight shooter in the committee. He, he had to work for the committee, but in fact he was working for the people, in, in my view. Oh, I like that. I, I tried to because it was, it was a difficult process. And I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of staff people up in that building that spent long hours uh, doing redrafting, redrafting. Senator Whitehouse was involved a lot because she had been on coastal to drafting. Uh, and it was just a, a number of number of people. And just you think about the people who have to type this information, just the secretaries. I mean, I, can't t I can honestly tell you that this room about this high would be full of the paperwork that we did in those three to four to five years. And that's no lie. You were up there when the paperwork was flying I can remember all that's in the days when, when, uh, when we're sitting at our desk when, when, uh, towards the end, especially. Yeah. We'd have piles of paper for the bill, the, not the bill, well, the bills themselves. Yeah. We had binders for the bills. But there were always substitute days or amendments. And then as they would pass, we just threw them on the floor. And at the end of the 2 o'clock in the morning, the floor would be... I'm, sure, I'm, I'm amazing the fire marshals didn't do something like that. But I, 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 think, I think people are often cynical about government. Uh, as if um, um, it's, it's not for them. Well, without it, where would we be? <laughs> I mean, we, we look at, at countries where there's chaos and bloodshed, uh, and it's, there are places where there's no rule of law where there's no authority, where there's no checking up on people who have power. Without some kind of rule of law, we would, everything we cherish would be lost. Last question. How come the process still in Rhode Island ends up where it's the end of the session, they're up all night, and they're, you know, what? Do other states have that, that where the last day of the session is where everything happens and things get flushed through? I think it depends on the state. For instance, I think it's Virginia, or yes, it is Virginia, I think, only meets three months. We meet six. Uh, Texas, I think they only meet for 30 days because their, really? yeah, their process is the less you guys are in here, the better. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, the less laws you change, the better. Uh, and it's hard in a state like Texas where the state is so big. Right. I remember, was it Texas? I think that a couple of years ago there was a, a uh, some of the legislators all left and went next door into the next state. That was to was, avoid redistricting. Was, redistricting, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they didn't have to vote on it. They're going to go get the police after them. I mean, so we're not alone. And I'll never forget going to Louisiana one time, a long time ago, and I was going to New Orleans with some friends for one of the basketball tournaments. And I'm getting off, the, the bus is driving me down to the hotel, and all I see is election signs, but elections for top sheriff, elections for county clerk, elections for clerks of court. Election, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, you could have a field day in here. You talk about Rhode Island. But imagine if you become the clerk of the court for the county, and, I'm, and that's oil country. So that's not, you know, GTEC or something. That's oil country with big money. And suppose that I want my, you know, lawsuit heard. I want to be first, or I want to be second, or I don't want it heard. If they're electing the clerks of the court, I'm just thinking they have funds. That, I'm just thinking, wow. I'll never forget that. I said, so, as far as the late night sessions, I don't know how the legislators do it. Every single year I've been up there, they've been sworn up and down that this won't happen. <laughs> and the promises have been made. And then something happens toward the end of the night. And it's usually one or two items that delay everything. Because I'm not going to pass your bill for whatever little thing you want or small thing that's important to you. Because I may need your vote here. And I'm not getting my answer back from the governor or the Senate president. The Senate president saying they're not getting the answer back from the speaker. Speaker saying governor's unreasonable. Governor saying speaker's unreasonable. 
<laughs> Same pipe of weeds every so that, then, then we get involved. Then we're running, but we're literally running back and forth. What if we do this? What if we do that? What if, and then there's outside entities that these things involve who may not want what we do it. So everything gets on hold. Uh, to me, it's like it's this huge chokehold. You know, you've got this two-year-long process to get stuff done, or, or a year-long process to get stuff done, and. All, all of the constraints, all of the things that get worked on to make sure that everything's done properly, and that, that when it actually comes down to it, awful things can just get flushed through because of, of that last second thing. It just lets all of those other safeguards really ultimately don't even matter if it can get squeeze through the chokehold. I will say the last 24 to 48 hours is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I will say things are missed. Un unintentional, I mean, with good intention, there may be a small thing that gets, okay, we're gonna, we got 45 bills coming from the Senate. Maybe there was a change to something that was done well-intentioned but had unintended consequences that gets through, and then all of a sudden it's now July or August, and we're sitting there saying, well, that's not what we meant. And all parties agree, but we missed it. It could just be a small language change. Uh, there was a criminal statute years ago that changed, and nobody wanted the change that was made the way it was made. It was just a couple of commas, and an and or was missed. And again, it went through late. But that's why the lawyers are really important. Thank you very much, Mike, for no problem.